on the first Sunday of every year, we have a very nice opportunity of presenting all those folks who have read through the Bible in an entire year with a, a certificate. And uh, I have not yet signed these certificates, so I will read the names, and then I will give you the certificates afterwards, after I've had a chance to sign them. But the folks who read through the Bible in 2014, a certificate is awarded to Carol Elwell, a certificate is awarded to Shirley Lee, and a certificate is awarded to Carol Whitbeck. And I encourage all of you to get them, because these certificates actually have attached to them a $500 gift certificate. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I bet a bunch of you would read through the Bible in a year if you were going to get a $500 gift certificate. <laughs> Listen, the heavenly rewards are worth far more than $500, and um, so I encourage you, please, uh, spend some time reading God's Word. We'll be talking a little bit about that today as we uh, talk about genealogies. You think, oh my, genealogies, that sounds like an awful subject. Uh, where are the pillows? I want to go to sleep right now. But don't go to sleep just yet. You'll discover there's some very exciting stuff that you probably didn't know about before uh, in the genealogies of the Bible. Also, I wanted to mention the fact the new Acts and Facts are here. We encourage you to pick these up and read them. Uh, this has got uh, some very interesting uh, articles, including, for example, devils, dinosaurs, and squirrel fossils. Hmm, what's the connection? Well, you'll find out. And the lead article, The Whole Council of God, very important because we're going to be talking about the whole Council of God today as we talk about genealogies. Now, as you know, the last time in this series was on December 14th, where we looked at verses 9 through 13. The message was entitled, Stop Talking, I Hurt. And then uh, the 21st was Christmas Sunday, the message, the incarnation of God. And then last week was Reverend Daniel Waite, lending to the Lord. So we've been out of the circuit for a little bit here in our study of the book of Exodus, and we'll have a, a brief review of what we looked at back on December 14th. You recall that that series of verses said, And the Lord spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel, and unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And that was immediately followed by the text that I read a few moments ago in Exodus 6, verses 14 through 19, where it begins to list the genealogies of those who were brought out of Egypt. God cares about bringing his people out of Egypt. He cares about them enough to give them names. He cares enough to list their families. God brings his children out of Egypt, which is a picture of the world, not merely leaving and going to heaven. We all look forward to that someday, but in Scripture, Egypt is not a picture of earth versus the promised land, which is heaven. And many of the songs mistake that, like on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie, as though we're sitting here just waiting to get to heaven, but it doesn't matter what's going on around us. Egypt is a picture of the world. Crossing the Jordan is a picture of the victorious Christian life and victory over the enemies. God cares about bringing you out of the world and into a victorious Christian life. Now let's review very briefly because we need this for our study today as we look at a genealogy. You think, well, at least maybe the first part will be more interesting than the second part. I think you'll find the genealogy part is very interesting. I hope so. But as we look at that passage that we studied several weeks ago on the 14th, the devil knows the perspective of an unregenerate man will always be clouded by physical pain. Even regenerate men and women, when we're going through physical pain, it tends to cloud our perspective. For the unbeliever, turning 
against the pain and turning toward God is something that is almost unheard of. Pagans always slap you in the face with that question, if God's so good and powerful, why is there pain and suffering in the world? And we, we went over many illustrations of that. The second thing we saw was in contrast, the true man or woman of faith will flee to the refuge of Christ when pain, suffering, and death stare him in the face. Because we know the answer. We know why pain and suffering and death are here, not because God is evil or impotent or careless, but pain and sin and death are in the world because our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned. And so pain and suffering and death passed on all of us, for all have sinned. Second, we sinned in and with Adam and Eve because we were in their genetic offspring when they sinned. Let me move that so we don't get the racket, I hope. All right. Because we were in their genetic offspring. I tell you what, let's just turn the speaker microphone off. There's something going on here. Now I think we can go on. You'll just have to listen to me shout, those of you in the back row. Most of you are in the back row today. Well, anyway. <laughs> Our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned, and so pain, suffering, and death entered into the world. Second, we sinned in and with Adam and Eve because we are the genetic offspring when they sinned, and that's the doctrine of federal headship, which we've studied in detail in the past, and that is the reason why one man, just as one man brought sin and pain and death and suffering into the world, that one man, Jesus Christ, can make us righteous through faith in his finished work at Calvary. Third, we are all individually sinners. We are stinking and filthy in the sight of a truly holy God, no matter how good we think ourselves to be. So when the pagans slap you with that, you know, why is there such suffering and death if God is good? The answer is not the problem with God. The problem is with man, because we are wicked and evil and part of the curse. Three, before giving us a solution empowered by the Spirit of God, instead of the solution that we want, which is always empowered by the flesh, God allows us often to get to the breaking point so that we have nowhere else to turn except to Him. This does at least three things that we studied. Three for the believer, three for the unbeliever. For the believer, suffering increases our faith. Two, it gives us a clearer understanding of the value of eternal things over the value of temporal things. Third, it allows us, when we go through pain, to manifest forth the fragrance of Jesus Christ by the way in which we respond to the pain that we're facing. In contrast, for the unbeliever, pain gets their attention that temporal solutions will never work. Number two, for the unbeliever, pain shows that life really is going to end in death and it may be soon. Third, it gives the unbeliever an opportunity to open his or her heart and turn his or her mind to the true solutions that God has to offer in Christ. The problems don't go away when we respond properly, but a proper response does give us a clear focus on the divine perspective of time and eternity and what really matters. We saw also in that passage that there was a lesson for leaders who have been called by God. And all of us, because we have been entrusted with the gospel of Christ, really do have some leadership opportunities throughout life whereby we are able to share Christ with others. But we need to learn that we shouldn't be surprised when people don't respond to the message that God has sent us to bring if they are facing difficult personal problems. And we look at many different kinds of problems. We covered them briefly anyway. Things that related to finances, emotions, health-related, family-related, work-related, goal-related, comfort-related, friendship-related, enemy-related, true love-related, parent-related, child-related, government-related, <laughs> which is what they were facing here in the text. And whatever the case, the crisis situation usually takes first place in the thoughts of the people who are going through the crisis, and they're not interested in the theological answers that we have to offer, even if the answers are right. They want pragmatic answers, and that's what Moses was facing here in this text. You recall he said back in verse 9, Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for the anguish of spirit and for their cruel bondage. The next issue was even worse for the leader, at least in this text, and it often is in our lives as well. If my people won't listen and go back to the source of the problem, the source that made it worse on my people will get even worse than it was before. It seems to make sense. You don't go and irritate the source of the problem. And that's what God's telling him to do. Go back to Pharaoh. Irritate the source of the problem. The guy who's been making it hard for your people. 
Moses says that doesn't make any sense. You know, a lot of times what God tells us to do doesn't make human sense. But it makes perfect divine sense because God has a long-range goal that you can't see. There's a mountain standing between you and the goal and God is up here and he sees the goal on the other side and you're down here and all you see is the mountain. And God says, climb the mountain. Lord, can it go around the mountain? Climb the mountain. Can I find, if there's a tunnel through the mountain, climb the mountain. Uh, can't I hire an airplane and fly over the mountain? Climb the mountain. Has God ever told you in your life to climb the mountain? I look back over life and I think of dozens and dozens and dozens of times of climbing the mountain. It's sort of expressed on those t-shirts that you see walking around today and the t-shirt says, oh no, another learning experience. <laughs> You've seen that. You know what? God is going to take you through learning experience after learning experience because he wants to conform you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And you know, if you don't learn the lesson, you will get the same learning experience over again. Because God takes us step by step. He doesn't jump over all the intermediate steps. He brings us through those steps until he brings us to the point of conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. Now we know that that will happen ultimately in heaven. But meanwhile, he is transforming us by the renewing of our mind, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, so we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove it not only to ourselves, but prove it to the people who are all around us, people who are watching us, other believers who are weaker in their faith and who need someone as an example, unbelievers who are watching us carefully to see if we really mean what we say or if we're only hypocrites. God brings us through the learning experiences. And that's what God is doing here with Moses and he gives him Aaron to go with him. We talked about the reminder of those under authority, the different things that are responsible for, that we are responsible when we are under authority. And then we saw that there are ten I will promises in the text. Two of those are stated twice concerning the land of the heritage, just like there were ten plagues and ten commandments. And we didn't have time to talk about ten, and maybe someday we will. The final lesson that we learned was God always provides the necessary assistance. Always. He never tells you to do something that he doesn't also empower you to do. He never tells you to do something unless he gives you the assistance necessary to accomplish what he has told you to do. God never leaves you in the lurch. He doesn't leave you on the desert island. He will always provide a boat. It may leak, but he'll provide the boat for you to get off the desert island. He doesn't leave you in shark-infested waters without sending a helicopter to rescue you just before the sharks attack. He never tells you to do something across the jungles of South America unless he provides a trail guide. He provides the provisions. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He does not supply our greed. He supplies our need. Most of us complain because we think we need more than God knows that we need. But if you are walking by faith, if you are in the center of his will, he will provide what you need for the crisis that you face at the moment. It might even be the crisis of death. And the need is real. But it's not that you'll live. You may die, but he'll provide what is necessary in his sustaining grace to see you through it. You see, we always assume a different need than God may have in mind, and the grace that he provides is the grace that is necessary for the crisis of the moment, so that he receives the greatest amount of glory, we receive the greatest amount of good, and God's people receive the greatest blessing as they watch us go through the crisis. That's not how we like to look at it, is it? We want God to give us our solution to the crisis that we're facing. We need money. We want to win the lottery. <laughs> you better not play the lottery. <laughs> You're in serious trouble with the Lord and with his church, too, if you do. Do not play the lottery. But we want some rich uncle, maybe, to die and leave us a fortune. It's not God's solution. Many times he wants us to learn to cast all our care upon him because he cares for us. 
He wants us to learn to turn to Him and say, Father, you know my needs. I'm committing my needs to you. And I thank you in advance for what you are going to do in this circumstance and situation. Maybe it's a lost job. Maybe it's a lost spouse, as I've gone through. God knows what we need and provides for what we need, not for what we want. Important lessons for us to learn. God still deals with his people as well as with the recalcitrant persecutors of his people. And yet there's coming a day of reckoning and judgment when the Lord, the righteous judge of all the earth, will deliver his own in the ultimate and final sense. And we see that in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 and following. And I saw heaven opened. Behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's Jesus. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, Psalm 2. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying unto all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. There is coming a day of reckoning for Pharaoh, and for all those who have been like Pharaoh through the centuries, and all those who will stand against Christ when he returns to earth. And God's people will be delivered. Remember, we cry out, stop talking, I hurt. God hears your cry. And he is not oblivious to it. He is not careless about it. He knows the pain that you're going through. And he loves you. And he answers in ways that are beyond our understanding, our comprehension, our ken. He answers in a way that brings him glory, brings us good, brings a testimony to those around us to encourage believers in their faith, to challenge unbelievers to trust Christ, because he is the Christ who can see you through your crisis. And that brings us to the genealogical text that we looked at a few moments ago. We'll be talking about some of the specific individuals in that text in later weeks, but today I want us to have an overview of why in the world are those genealogy passages in the Bible? Why is it here? Well, we mentioned at the beginning of this message, the first obvious reason that it's there is God was letting you know who was coming out of Egypt. He was going to bring people from each of the tribes out of Egypt. He was going to tell you who their ancestors were and the different families under those ancestral heads that would be coming through the wilderness wanderings. Teaches you some lessons that no matter which group you were with, most were going to die in the wilderness because they did not learn to walk by faith. They rebelled instead. Ten times they rebelled against him, the scripture says. And God kept a record of it. But he wants to let you know that everybody had an equal chance as they came out. Folks, the crossing of the Red Sea can be equated with salvation experience, but then you begin the Christian walk. Are you going to walk in the wilderness or are you going to enter the land of promise? And are you going to win your fight over the giants? 
Are you going to do battle in the power of the Holy Spirit, wearing the spiritual armor that's described for us in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20? Or are you going to murmur and groan and complain, even though God feeds you and clothes you for 40 years through the wilderness, their shoes didn't wear out and their clothes didn't get old? Can you imagine having clothes that don't wear out for 40 years? Now, you might get tired of wearing the same set of clothes, but they never wear out. I mean, they're made out of Tyvek or Teflon or something. They don't get holes in them. Never wear out. I just got an email from my son-in-law, and he was talking about his five little boys and how quickly they are growing. Uh, the uh, Three of those little guys, amazing, are three years old now. And one has just turned four and one is one. Uh, and he said, you know, they seem to outgrow their clothes within a week. But then he laughed and he said, but of course, they wear holes in their clothes within a week anyway, so we have to get new clothes anyway. <laughs> Can you imagine raising your kids in the wilderness? Stumble over rocks and your sandals never wear out. Raising your kids in the wilderness and they're falling down in the dirt and on the rocks and climbing over cactuses and everything else. And their clothes never wear out. How long are you going to spend in the wilderness? God provides even when you're in the wilderness. But when they had opportunity to go into the land, they rebelled. And they turned their backs on God. And God said, all right, I'm going to teach you a lesson. Genealogies are very important. And I want to give you several important reasons backed by Scripture as to why they are important. The first reason that genealogies are important is they are inspired by God. Never overlook that key fact. Genealogies are part of the inspired scripture. And we're supposed to study them. Did you know that? Let me read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Actually, through verse 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, do you think the Apostle Paul, when he was teaching Timothy, and when Timothy's mother and grandmother were teaching Timothy, do you think that in their daily Bible reading program, they got to the genealogical passages and they just sort of, well, this is really boring and he's only a little kid and I think we'll skip this part. Do you think they did that? If you know anything about Paul, you know they didn't do that. And what Paul commends Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, for, I don't think they did that either. They were raising him to be a, a boy who believed the scriptures. And that all of the scripture was equally important. We don't know all the reasons why all of them are important, because we don't study it enough, but we're going to learn why these genealogies are important. Verse 15, And thou from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. Did you know that the genealogies tell you something about Jesus Christ? They do. If you read the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, you discover they not only track you back to David, but they track you in Luke all the way back to Adam. It tells you something about the Messiah. The genealogies of national Israel tell you something about the Messiah and about what he is going to deal with when he comes back to rule national Israel. We spent 13 weeks on that subject. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Does that mean that the genealogies are given by inspiration of God? Hello, is anybody awake out there? Everybody who thinks that the genealogies are given by inspiration of God, please raise your hands. I don't see all the hands. Okay, all right. <laughs> all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration is the word, it's a rare word, only occurs here. It means God breathed. Not inhaled, exhaled from the lungs of God. <sighs> he exhaled the scriptures. It came from his very inner being. 
That means that the genealogies that are recorded in your Bible were breathed into the Bible by God. Does that make them rather significant? Suppose that you got a redacted Bible. That means somebody has cut parts of it out. Thomas Jefferson did that, you know. There was the Jefferson Bible, and he went through and he clipped out all the things that he didn't think should be in the Bible and uh, ended up with this much, much abbreviated version. There are multiple Bibles on the market today that are these redacted Bibles where, you know, the editors decided what they thought was important. They cut everything else out. What they always cut out, of course, is the genealogy. That's one of the things they always cut out. Okay, suppose you got the redacted parts. Suppose that the only Bible you had was loaded with genealogies. And that's all you had. <laughs> Would it still be Bible verses? Yes. Would it still be profitable to you? Yes. You might have to work a little harder at it. Do you think if all you had was the genealogical passages and a few connectors that tell you why they're there, that you could come to Christ? The answer is yes. I've done some study with the genealogical passages. And Jesus Christ is clearly set forth as to who he is and what he did. Even in the genealogies, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And listen to the next phrase, and is profitable. Are the genealogies profitable? I mean, we're looking at overview right now. We want to establish some foundation benchmarks. And is profitable. So and so begets, 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 so and so. And in between that, you see, and he died, 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 and he died. You get the idea, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The wages of sin is death. And then you begin to come to some genealogies that relate to Jesus. And you discover there's an answer to the death problem. The answer is eternal life, and Jesus provides it. And it's found in the genealogies. We'll see that. And is profitable. And is profitable for four things. For doctrine. For reproof. For correction for instruction in righteousness and there's a purpose and it's given in verse 17 that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works notice it's thoroughly not thoroughly it's thoroughly that means through and through internal permeation not just complete but internal permeation thoroughly furnished unto all good works God gave the genealogies by inspiration. If we had no other reason, that would be enough to study the genealogies. But there are many more reasons, too. We know that genealogies are important to God. Remember, God limited what he included in his inspired word. I mean, how big is your Bible? Can you carry your Bible around with you? Do you have to carry the Library of Congress around with you any time you want to be able to study the Scriptures? And every place you go, you know, you got the Library of Congress. And, well, nowadays we might be able to get that on a couple of computer chips, you know, and plug it in and look things up. Can you carry your Bible in your hand? Even big, fat Bibles? Even Bibles with commentary in them? Even Bibles with footnotes? Yes, you can. Is the Bible partial or is it complete? It is complete. Not merely is all scripture given by inspiration of God, but it is complete. It is finished. We do not need external revelation. We do not need additional information. God has given us his final and finished word. You've got it. You own it. God limited what he included in his inspired word. He only put in what is important for us to know. Now, many times in my life, there are lots of other things that I wish that God had included in the Bible because I really, really, really want to know what they were. Like, for example, it says the seven thunders uttered their voices, and I was about to write, and the angel said unto me, Seal up what you heard. John got to know it, but I don't get to know it. There are some things that you want to know. You know, 
like I suspect that most of us back in our courting days would have loved to have had a verse that, you know, any time any Christian looked at that verse, it would put in the name of the one he was going to marry. Whoa, man, wouldn't that be cool? You flip it open, and, and you, so-and-so, living in such and such a time, will on such and such a date be married to, and the name of the girl, the name of the boy. <laughs> Lots of things we want to know. But you know, God has told you how to choose such a one. Oh, not all the standards that the world uses for choosing a mate, but he's told you what they're to be like, they're to be saved, they're to be morally pure, they're to be developing the character of Christ. If you want a happy marriage, they will have certain character qualities you know, like, you read the book of Proverbs and it talks about the wrong kind of a woman to marry. I read the book of Proverbs a lot before I got married. And, uh, you know, it, it talks about the contentious woman and she's like, you know, a continual dripping in a rainy day and <laughs> things like that. There are certain types you don't want to marry. But you wish God would make it pablum. You know, Gerber's goop. You know, on a little teeny spoon that he sticks in your mouth and you go and spit it out. I can remember my mother used to tell me when I was a kid, but uh, she she fed me Gerber's goop, you know Gerber's baby food, but we called it Gerber's goop. And uh, <laughs> she said you would eat everything except the green peas. And she said you're always a happy baby. She said, but I'd take the green peas and I'd stick this in your mouth. You'd look like this, and then you go pour right back out. <laughs> Couldn't stand the green peas. Now I've learned to eat peas since then. But uh, you know that's a, an acquired habit. That's that's not natural with me, <laughs> folks. God wants us to grow and so some things are difficult and you have to study and you have to learn and as you do you have what's been called the joy of discovery as God opens the scriptures to you and the Holy Spirit who's working in your heart helps you understand not merely the technical theology but he helps you understand how that applies to you today oh I hope you go through that and don't just say well you know, Sunday's over, I guess I got a week to sort of fool around and do what I want. And next Sunday, I hope the pastor gets up there with something that's interesting to me and something that's really relevant to me and something that I can just uh, nibble on a little bit like potato chips and uh, uh, that'll get me through the week. Don't be like that, folks. The genealogies are difficult. I understand that. But the genealogies are inspired. And remember, God put them in and left other things out that we wish he would have included. And he included only the profitable things for us. Because he says so. Here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And it's profitable for four things. It's profitable for doctrine. He puts that first. If you get into false doctrine, you will get into false practice. What a man really believes in his heart will come out in his life. What you believe affects what you do. So if you do not have true doctrine, your life will have some very major holes in it. There will be places where the worms are eating away like mad and chewing up the wood. You don't want that. The first thing is God's word is profitable for doctrine. Does that mean that the genealogies are profitable for doctrine? Yes. If you try to eliminate that, then you say, okay, well, the genealogies, maybe they're, they're, um, they're profitable for reproof. How's a genealogy going to reprove me? Well, I guess that one doesn't count. Um, well, the genealogy for correction is the next reason he gives here. Um, well, I don't see how a genealogy is going to correct me anyway. It's just a list of names. So we'll throw that one out. And then the last one, for instruction in righteousness. Hmm. I don't see how a genealogy can instruct me in righteousness. Well, I guess I'll throw that one away. So suddenly, it's no longer profitable. And scripture was inspired to be profitable. So maybe it's not inspired. And suddenly you're following the line of the liberals who walk down the path and say, this is not important. When we do our revised Bible, when we redact this little Bible that we're going to sell for multi-millions of bucks because people don't know any different, uh, it will leave them out. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You know why the devil wants you to believe that it's not? Because he does not want to occur what is stated in verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect. That's the word teleos. 
That's the word for that which is fully developed, fully mature. You know, Paul says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. God's goal for us is to bring us to maturity. As we partake of the word of God, he brings us to maturity because it's the mature individual who is able to fight the battles of life. It's the mature Christian who's able to wear the armor and carry the sword and wield it effectively because he has a grasp of the sword and Paul tells us the sword is the word of God. Can you use the genealogies as part of the sword when you are attacked by the devil's crowd and be able to defend? Not just defend, but it's the only offensive weapon listed in the spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter 6. All the rest are defensive. The shield of faith, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, girdle of truth, feet shot of the preparation of the gospel of peace. All of those are defensive. They protect you. The only thing with which you can attack the devil's forces is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Do you know how to use the genealogies? I hope you learned some lessons from what we're covering here as to how to do that. So the genealogies have a purpose, to make the man of God perfect, teleos, mature, thoroughly furnished, that is totally equipped, through and through, permeates every fiber of your being unto all good works. Now, we're not saved by good works, but Ephesians 2, verse 10, tells us why we are saved. You know verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The genealogies are part of what prepares you and thoroughly equips you to do the good works that God has ordained for you to do. I don't know how to stress this strongly enough, but when you get to those genealogical passages, those of you who are reading through the Bible in a year, and I commend you for doing so, I hope that you don't get to those passages, put it on automatic pilot, begin to think about what you're going to do next week when you're going to the grocery store, what things you have to have in your list as your eyes ball sort of just roll down the page through those big long lists of names and begats and dies and all that kind of stuff. But you're actually thinking about, why did God put that one in? I don't know if you noticed it, but not everybody that we read in that list today, for example, they didn't tell you how old they were when they died, but they told you about some of them. And they gave you a few other little hints about certain individuals in that passage. Did you notice that when I was reading it, or did you think, oh no, here we go, genealogy, listen to all those weird names, you know? I wonder if he can make it through pronouncing all those names. There are a few little hints about individuals in those lists. Did you notice that as I was reading it through? There's a purpose. As you study genealogies, it helps you to mature spiritually. It will be what we might call your wilderness survival outfitter. You know, anybody who goes into the wilderness to uh, do any exploration normally uh, goes to a survival outfitter. I uh, came across an interesting book, which I wasn't exactly sure what it was, but it, it was, you know, at Dollar Tree for a buck, and it was something... I don't remember the exact title, but it said something about survival guide. I thought, oh, that looks interesting. Maybe I'll get it for one of the kids for Christmas. I got it home, began to look through it, and I thought, this is really good. I'm going to keep this one. <laughs> not giving this one away for Christmas. I'm going to keep this one. <laughs> and because uh, it's some very practical things, not about, you know, make sure your knife is sharp kind of stuff, but dealing with the world around you, some practical tips many of them biblical. The guy who wrote it I don't think is a Christian, but he gives you illustration after illustration after illustration of people who have survived in crisis situations. And what did they do? For example, illustrations from the Holocaust. Various Jews who managed to survive during the Holocaust. And I thought, boy, some of this is really practical. Some of this shows that God's hand is at work in the lives of those Jews. Those of you who someday perhaps will see the film that my brother produced. By the way, that's something else to be in prayer about. Within the last 20 days, he has suddenly been flooded with 
special kinds of contacts. I can't give you any more information than that right now. But special kinds of contacts for the distribution of this film far wider than he ever thought possible. It's called Return to the Hiding Place. It's the story not merely of the Ten Boom family, whom you know from The Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom and her family, but the teenagers and junior high age kids that worked with Corey, her teenage army, that worked to help out with the escape of various Jews around Holland, thousands of them. In fact, that group of teenagers actually rescued an entire orphanage of Jewish children just minutes before the Nazis came in to annihilate them. It's a fantastic film. Won many Christian Film Festival awards. Watch for it. The Return to the Hiding Place, and hopefully it will be out uh, not very long from now. But um, anyway, I lost my train of thought, and I can see time is is flying here. Let us move on. Okay, now what do we? What else can we learn from genealogies? Well, let's just give you a few of the facts. There are more than 1,000 verses in the Bible containing genealogical records. More than a thousand verses containing genealogical records in the Bible. The word father of occurs 94 times. The term begat occurs 225 times. The word child occurs 205 times in 183 verses. The word children occurs 1,822 times in 1,524 verses. The word family occurs 123 times in 76 verses. The word families, plural, occurs 174 times in 164 verses. The words daughter of so you're not just we're not just biased for the boys here. It's daughters of too for those of you who got girls. Uh, the words daughters of occurs 175 times in 155 verses. The word daughter occurs 327 times in 228 verses. The word daughters plural occurs 254 times in 224 verses. The word sons occurs 1,105 times in 967 verses. The words son of occur a whopping 1,164 verses. That's in your straight genealogical tables, not just part of a genealogy. The term son occurs 2,393 times in 1,799 verses. There are over 1,000 names in the Bible. Folks, genealogies and names are essential for another reason. They're essential for an accurate history. And the Bible is the most accurate history of the world. Third, and I'm going to talk about this, the Lord willing, more next week. The genealogies give us a record of sin and redemption. The genealogies give us a record of sin and redemption. So I think we can conclude that it is therefore edifying for believers who are willing to study why the genealogies are there but it is indeed profitable to us. Secondly, the genealogies show us that God cares about individuals, not just mass movements of humanity. The genealogies show that God cares about individuals. Third, and this is very important, <clears throat> the genealogies show us that God is keeping records of individuals. The genealogies show us that God is keeping records of individuals. That means he's keeping a record of you. Not just of your general family, not just generally of this church. He's keeping a record of you. Fourth, the genealogies show that individuals are individually and not merely corporately accountable to God. I'm just going to read you some of these verses and then we're going to have to stop because our time is up. Matthew 12, verse 36. Here's some of the records God's keeping. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Every word that you speak. Did you say something unkind? Did you tell a lie? Did you say something off color? Did you say something that was bitter or envious or cruel? These are the words of Jesus when he says, every idle word of, that men shall speak. Every idle word that men shall speak. They shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. We are individually, not merely corporately, accountable to God. Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven 
who had servants. And it says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto the certain king, which would take account of his servants. And you know the story. He called them each in. And each one had to give an account of the stewardship that had been entrusted to him. So will you and so will I. In Luke chapter 16, verse 2, another illustration that Jesus gave, he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee, the guy who had been crooked, one of his stewards who had been crooked? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. Accountability also includes either benefits or losses. <clears throat> you say, well, that's Jesus talking in parables in the Gospels. Let me give you some doctrinal statements concerning that. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Romans 14, 12. I'm going to have to stand and give an account before God for every minute of time that I spent on earth. Am I maximizing the potential that God gave to me, or am I just sliding by, doing just enough to look okay? Am I maximizing my energy? Am I maximizing my resources? Am I maximizing my time? Am I maximizing the gifts that God has given to me? I hope you ask yourselves those questions, not me just asking me. Oh yeah, preacher, how are you spending your time? How did you spend your money last week? Did you pay as little as you possibly could for gas? By the way, I found one place where I bought gas for $1.98 a gallon. <laughs> and I do try to maximize resources on that issue too. I know that route and I know where the cheap stations are all the way down to Alabama. But seriously, are you maximizing what God has given to you? Because someday you will give an account to God. Are you maximizing your family? Are you maximizing your prayer time? Are you maximizing your opportunities to grow in Christ through study of the scripture and listening to the word of God, reading the word of God, being taught the word of God? Are you maximizing it? So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Paul emphasizes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What are you doing with what you know? What are you doing with what you've got? When you have opportunity to witness for Christ, what are you doing with it? Are you embarrassed? Are you ashamed? Or you say, well, it doesn't quite fit the situation here because after all, you know, people might think badly of me if I did it in this particular circumstance or that situation. You know, there are going to be some results. And Paul explains that in Philippians, chapter 4, verse 17. Paul is talking there about how the Philippians have been so generous in supporting him and his ministry. And he says, now I'm not telling you this because I want you to give me more money. But I'm telling you this because it's going to count for eternity. Listen to what he says. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Wow, what a different perspective. Most of us are so self-centered, we'd say, well, it just I want it just for me. Paul said, you know, I am delighted that you're doing that because that means that God is going to give something to you, a blessing. Hebrews 13, 7 and 17, two very key verses, because they deal with the context of the local church and giving account in the end concerning how we have functioned within the context, within this, this ball that we call the local church. Verses 7 and 17. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. As you consider, what is the end of their manner of life? Verse 17, Obey them that have a rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account. Did you know that someday I'm going to have to give an account for every one of you? I'm going to have to give an account for every one of you. I was going to say, how did you deal with such and such a sheep? Sheep number 472. <laughs> He'll name you. And, um, okay, that was an appropriate way to deal with them. How did they respond? I'll say, well, Lord, sheep 472 um, hardened their heart. Sheep 363 
on that same issue, and I preached on it on such and such a Sunday, cheap number 363, was curious about it, but didn't follow through, just sort of lackadaisical and never applied it to their life. But sheep 127, they heard that, their eyes opened, I could see an excitement on their face, and they went out and did it! <laughs> Praise God! I have to give an account for every one of you. I've known all of you for more than seven years now. It was seven years as of December 1st, because December 1st, 2007, was the time that I officially came here. I knew some of you before that, because I was here you know, a few months before candidating and all that. I'm going to have to give an account. Oh, sheep number 527. Oh, recalcitrant, stubborn, hard-hearted. Did everything possible to be irritating and provocative, and what a grief they were to me. Did you know I'm not going to be able to lie about you? I'm not going to be able to say nice things about you or bad things if I wanted to. I'm going to have to tell the truth. I'm going to have to tell the truth. Did you hear that verse? Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. Now I love the next part. That they may do it with joy and not with grief. Folks, for some of you, I'm going to be able to give an account with joy. For some of you, the Lord already knows my grief. Because I pour out my soul to him almost on a daily basis concerning some of the things that I have to deal with. That they may do it with joy and not with grief. Listen to the last phrase. For that is unprofitable for you. Sometimes I almost think it would have been better for you not to have a pastor than to have a pastor who has to give a bad account. For that is unprofitable for you. Genealogies are important because individuals are important. God cares about us by name. He calls the stars by name. Do you think he doesn't know your name? There are more stars out there than there are people. And someday, because he has made me an under-shepherd, and sometimes I wish he hadn't, but he did, and it's the calling he gave me, I must be faithful to it. Someday I'm going to have to give an account for each of you. And I want so much to do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. 1 Peter 4, 5 Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Are you ready for it? You will give a personal individual account to God. I will have to give an account for you. The various pastors under whom you have sat, if they were true pastors, some are apostates and won't even be in heaven, but are you ready for it? Genealogies are important because God cares about individuals. God cares about you. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power and the things that we've learned today as we've been reminded that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Make us a people who love your word who study your word, who meditate on your word, who study it so deeply that we'll understand why each of the genealogies is there. Father, we pray that you'll glorify your Son, Jesus Christ, in the way in which we live our lives, so that when we give an account, it will be with joy and delight and thanksgiving that you guided and directed us all the way. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 565-60,